All right, the sermon title this morning is uh, The Sin of Fornication. The Sin of Fornication. And um, the reason why I'm preaching on this this morning, you might be thinking, Victor, is somebody in the church committing fornication? Well, I hope, I hope not, <laughs> you know, but that's not the reason why I'm preaching this sermon this morning. I've been thinking about um, the negative societal effects um, that the unideal family situation brings. And really, um, our society's attitude towards fornication really is the root of this problem. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, is how we, you know, fornication is just so commonplace these days. You know, and, and, you know, it shouldn't be obviously in the house of God, but even amongst churches, fornication is commonplace. In a lot of churches, people are committing fornication, going out and, you know, dating people and, you know, having sex outside of marriage. And it's just so commonplace that even I hear stories about people dating these days where people, you know, if, if they're not willing to go to bed with each other before they're married, that's seen as like, do you not love me? Do you not, you know, do you not want this relationship to be serious? And to me, that sort of mentality blows my mind because, I mean, obviously I come from a more, you know, Asian background, it's a bit more conservative. And even today amongst Asians, fornication is still shameful. Whereas, you know, we see in Western civilization, even in Australia, where it's just, it's just commonplace, it's just what people do. They date, they go on Tinder, they go on dating apps, and then they hook up, and then, then they just go to bed with each other. And then, then we wonder why our society is the way it is. You know, when we have this sort of attitude towards fornication. So we hear stories like, I mean, I don't even want to think about the things that happen on college campuses, in schools. I mean, here these days, you know, the year 11, the year 12 prom, students going under the tables and, you know, fornicating, you know, things happening at the colleges. I mean, things that we all, you know, we, sh we can't even speak about. It's so shameful, the things that are happening there. And this is the day and age that we live in. And, you know, fornication is such a serious sin. Like we read in 1 Corinthians 5, it is something that is not tolerated in God's house. This is how serious this sin is. Because think about it, right? All of us are sinners. We all sin. But there are some sins that are tolerated. Like, you know, if, you are, if you're in sin, in specific sins, you know, these, these things that we understand and, and, you know, you're still welcome at church when certain sins are being committed. But we read in 1 Corinthians 5, there are certain sins that if they are being committed, they must be dealt with. They cannot be allowed in the church. Why? Because they have effects on the church. And this is why fornication is so serious as well, because it has real societal effects. And this is what uh, we are talking about today. And we want to go through some of the scriptures there. So let's first talk about what is fornication. Because most people think fornication is only sex outside of marriage between people that are not married themselves, which is not only what fornication is. That's the general idea that people have, and that's generally how it's used. When we think about fornication, we think about people that are single, they're not married at all, and then they go to bed with one another. Um, but in the Bible, fornication is more than that, right? Because fornication is not just that scenario. Fornication includes adultery, it includes homosexuality, it includes bestiality. So a, a more proper definition of fornication is really just sex outside of the marriage covenant. So that's why when somebody commits adultery, they're having sex outside of the marriage covenant, that's still considered fornication. So think of fornication like a broad category and underneath fornication you have what's generally known as fornication which is single people having sex without with each other outside of marriage but then you have other types of fornication too that have specific names like adultery you know bestiality homosexuality and stuff like that and these all come under the category of fornication and i just want to show you that in the bible as well first of all we looked at first corinthians 5 uh, verse 1, look, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, look, that one should have his father's wife. Right? So not only is this one of the relationships that is outlawed in Leviticus, and we'll go there in a moment, but in 1 Corinthians 
Uh, we'll go there later on. But in 1 Corinthians 5, we see here that it's actually called fornication. So you see the fornication that is being committed in this specific instance in 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul is saying, hey, we've got to get this leaven out. Right? So just like it le leavens a society, it does the same with the church. There's, there's certain types of ungodliness that just cannot be tolerated because of the, it, its effect on the church. But notice here, it says here, that the fornication being committed was somebody with his father's wife. So this was actually adultery that was happening here, but it's called fornication. Look at Revelation 2. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. So what was one of the sins of this woman Jezebel in this church? She was seducing her, the, the servants of God to commit fornication fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols and i gave her space to repent of her fornication look and she repented not behold i will cast her into a bed and look them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repented of their deeds so notice committing fornication with my servants them that commit adultery with her into great tribulations. You see how it's used interchangeably there. So we know adultery is part of fornication. A couple more. Ezekiel 16, verse 29. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. So what is Ezekiel 16 about? Ezekiel 16 is a chapter rebuking God's people for idolatry, and that picture of idolatry, of you know, you know, joining yourself to a false god is being likened to a wife joining herself to somebody else, another husband. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman. And you know, that's the truth of it. You know, like women think, oh, you know, they're empowered, the sexual revolution. But it's not, they're, they're, their heart is weak. You know, that's what the Bible says when you have to, you have to depend on, you know, this, this sexual relationship in order to feel empowered. The Bible says here, how weak is thine heart? You know, when you commit fornication, saith the Lord God. Seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, so here's the analogy of the idolatry here, and makest thine high place in every street, so what is it talking about? It's like when the nation of Israel would go and worship on the high places and the groves. So it's referring to these things. In every street, and has not been as an harlot in that, in that thou scornest higher, but as a wife that committeth adultery, with ta which taketh strangers instead of her husband. So notice here, see how we started saying, hey, you're committing all this fornication? But what is the fornication that's being committed? Hey, you're like a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. And look at this. They give gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, Whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. What is he saying here in Ezekiel 16? See, when people commit fornication, right, and they go out, it's like, what, what the Bible is saying here is like, you're almost worse than a prostitute. Because at least a prostitute gets paid for what they're doing. And he's saying like, here, you, you know, Oh, what does he say here? Uh, place. Here. And hast not been as an harlot in that thou scornest tired. So you see how people that commit fornication, if your boyfriend or, you know, their boyfriend was to go, oh, here, here's a hundred bucks for the night. Thanks a lot. You're going to be like, who do you think I am? You think I'm like a prostitute? And the Bible's saying here, at least a prostitute does it for some gain. Whereas when somebody fornicates, they just give it away for free. You scorn her. That's what it's talking about here. So it's saying you're the contrary when, you do, when people commit fornication in that thou givest a reward. You're giving something rather than a reward given unto you. Obviously, it's not exalting prostitution, but it's, but it's just putting it in perspective. You know, we 
might scoff and like say, oh, those prostitutes, like how, how dare they do these things? But do we think of fornication the same way? I mean, actually, fornication is worse than those women that are doing it for money. And obviously, both are wrong. Matthew 19. Let's look at this passage. This is Jesus uh, talking about the bill of divorcement. I think this is probably the strongest case uh, for fornication being adultery. It says, They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? So he's referring to the law in Deuteronomy 24. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So we see here the one exception to marriage, which is fornication. Now, when we go, what, what law is being quoted here by Jesus in Matthew 19, when they're saying, hey, Moses, when, when the Pharisees brought up, hey, Moses commanded to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away, what law are they referring to? They're referring to Deuteronomy 24, so we can go there and see what this law says. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass, and, and that's, my position is when, when you take, if you don't know, when a man take, when you're betrothed, is, is like, it's like a stronger form of engagement, right? Like he, today, people get engaged, but they're not considered husband and wife, and they break that promise. They shouldn't break that promise, but people do. They kind of go back on their engagement. But if, if somebody goes back on their engagement, it's not, cons it's not treated like a marriage. Where in the Bible, betrothal is a, lot, a much stronger engagement. Where if you're betrothed to somebody, we'll see this later, it's treated like marriage. You're actually called their wife. That's why when Joseph, remember, was betrothed to Mary, she was called his wife. But what does it mean when you take a wife? You take a wife is when you actually go and now, now you live together. Right? So if you remember, he, remember how the angel said to Joseph, fear not to take unto thee, marry thy wife. And then he took her. So they were betrothed. They weren't living together. And you take a wife and now you're living together. And I believe when the Bible says, and married, you marry is when that is actually consummated. They actually sleep together. So I think already this shows that it's not just the, they're not just betrothed because people have different positions on this passage i personally believe this is already saying that a man hath taken a wife and they've consummated the marriage and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her so that that phrase is talking about the fornication that jesus mentioned right so there's been some adultery that's gone on here then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house and when she is departed out of his house she may go and be another man's wife and if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house or if the latter husband die which took her to be his wife her former husband which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled for that is abomination before the lord and thou shalt not cause the land to sin which the lord thy god giveth thee for an inheritance. So I don't know if you've ever read this law before, so it's an interesting law how God goes about uh, marriage and divorce, but if we see here that there is a way for people to be divorced, and that's if fornication has happened in the relationship. Obviously, that's not ideal to begin with. That doesn't mean as well that just because fornication has occurred that necessarily people have to break up. Sometimes it's wiser to stay together for the, for the sake of the children. But sometimes there are situations, for example, where somebody has committed fornication and they've like bailed on somebody and they've gone and, and, the, and the person that is left is like stuck believing that they can't go on with their life and get married even though the person has no interest at all and has married somebody else and is living their own life where they've got, you know, you think about the situation where a couple breaks up and then maybe the guy leaves the girl for somebody else goes and marries somebody else, has a new life, gets another job and kids, and they're, 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 they're living their life fine, but the person who has been left is thinking, I can't get married anymore just because like, you know, I have to be faithful to this person that has already started another life. These are the practical implications of misunderstanding marriage and divorce. So it's not that we want to necessarily encourage divorce. Obviously, we don't encourage divorce, encourage fornication. But this is why this law exists in those situations but what's interesting here is it's saying if a man and wife divorce and uh, the woman goes on to marry another if that man then divorces her 
or that man even dies, right? So when that marriage is now nullified, she can never go back to her former husband. Now, I don't always understand exactly why that is, but God has this law, and, I, and, I, and I, it probably has something to do with the picture of Christ and the church, and you know, once it's kind of like you, you've rejected, you can't come back. So it probably has something to do with that picture. But that's, that's an interesting point here, that it, that it says that. You know, a lot of people don't know that that's the case, that if you divorce lawfully, right, somebody gets married to another person, even if they divorce lawfully, or that, that person even dies, the, the former husband and wife cannot get married back again. All right, let's go to Jeremiah 3. So Matthew 19 is where Jesus is talking about this law in Deuteronomy 24. In Deuteronomy 24, we see that if a man takes a wife and marries her and he finds some uncleanness in her, so what is this uncleanness? What is this fornication? Well, when we go to Jeremiah 3, God then uses this law as an analogy of his relationship with Judah and Israel. And you'll see here in verse 1 that it is referring to this law. They say, if a man put away his wife and she'd go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? So you see how that's the context of this passage. He's saying, hey, we're applying, Jeremiah is applying Deuteronomy 24, which is what Jesus was referring to when, when the Pharisees asked him about the bill of divorcement. Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness. And thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, My Father, thou art my guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw, look at this, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So you see there how even when God applies the analogy to himself, he likens the fornication to adultery. He's saying they committed adultery and I'd put her away. So you see how it's, it's not just that fornication. And this is mainly the point. I'm just going to all the different passages. Fornication just encompasses all sex outside of marriage. And that's why if, if, you, if you believed fornication was only sex between singles, and that's all fornication was, do you remember, I'm not going to scroll all the way back there, but if you remember in 1 Corinthians 5 when it lists out the things that will get you kicked out of church, it says fornicators, idolaters, extortioners. If fornicators is only single people having sex, does that mean if somebody's committing adultery, that's fine in church? You know, they can stay. But the single people that are committing adultery, you're out, right? You know, the homosexuals can come in, right? But no, the single people that are having sex, they're out. You know, it just doesn't, like somebody's having sex with an animal, they're, they're out of church, but the single people know they're out. And so you can see how that term just encompasses all the sex outside of marriage. Now, let's look at how God deals with fornication in the Bible, because there are actually laws in the Bible governing fornication in a society. And, and you may not be familiar with these laws, so we're going to go over them. And a lot of these laws, I think, should be, you know, put in today. If we, if we had the choice, like if we can enact laws that lined up with these things, this would do wonders for our society. But uh, unfortunately, you know, you know we're, we're so far to the left where, you know, people can get divorced for any reason and you can have de facto relationships. And, you know, now people are even pushing for like prostitution to be legal and all these sorts of stuff. So let's, uh, let's look at some of these laws. Exodus 22, verse 16. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, 
he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. So I don't know if you knew this, but in the Bible there is a law that says if two people sleep together, they're meant to get married. So you see how quick that would put a stop to fornication in a society. Right? Because now that, you're mar- now that you have to marry each other, you can't just keep fornicating because now you're committing adultery and adultery has very serious penalties in the Bible. So you see here, it says, hey, if, some, if a man entices somebody, they sleep together, then they now have to get married to him. The only thing that will stop them from getting married is if the father says, no, I'm not giving you that, that my, my daughter to marry you. And even if he says no to that marriage, the man still has to pay money according to the dowry of virgins. So you see how he's fined and to pay the father for taking his daughter's virginity. So this is something that would be so foreign today that people would just be like, what's going on, you need to get married? Because people are just having sex with everybody, right? But see, this would put a stop to that. Because once you have sex with somebody, now you're thinking, well, do I really want to spend the rest of my life with this person? Because that's what you're thinking about now. It's not, well, we can play around, we can fool around, we can have sex, have sex with this person, sex with that, sex with anyone I want. And then, oh, yeah, I'll think about marriage later. This means you need to think about marriage when you think about first having sex because the law will force you, right? And you might think, well, what father's going to... Well, I can imagine a father being like, hey, you, you get what you deserve. Like, you know, you want you to you lose your virginity to this guy and now you've got to live with the consequences. So I'm sure there's a lot of situations where the father does say, hey, you, you're going to get what you deserve, right? And you're going to marry this person. Um, and, but there may be situations where the father says, you know what, even though this situation has occurred. So you either, if you're a fornicator, it's not going to last very long or you're going to eventually run out of money, right? Because <laughs> you're going you're to keep paying, paying these dowries. But, uh, you know, with these sort of laws in place in a society, this stops these things because obviously the law is a deterrent. Let's look at some others. Uh, I want to go through these quickly, otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22. Now, some people get confused with this one when comparing it to Deuteronomy 24, so I'll just explain what's happening in Deuteronomy 22. If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him, and they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel." And she shall be his wife, he may not put her away all his days. But if this thing be true, and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel. To play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. Now, if you missed what was going on here, basically a a woman, um, a couple has been married, he's found out that she's not a virgin, right? And then she's had to prove her virginity. If she can't prove her virginity and she's found guilty, so we'll talk about that in a moment, then she's actually stoned. This is how serious this sin is. And you know, this is one thing that people say, and we're going to talk about the problems later on in this sermon. People will say things like, now why is God so harsh in the Bible? So somebody commits fornication and they're stoned? But see, we ought not think, why is God so harsh? We ought to realize this is the seriousness of this sin that God deals with it this way. You know, it's like when we think of hell. We don't think, why is God so harsh on lying? We need to think, that's what God thinks about lying, that he would create a place of eternal torment called hell. So why is this sin worthy of the death penalty because it's a serious sin so we need to shift our mentality to think it's not we think oh it's not that big a deal 
uh, people are committing fornication. It is a big deal. Now, what is the difference here between, you know, Exodus 22? Because why here, you know, if you, if you fornicate, you just get married. Deuteronomy 24, when there's fornication found, you know, the difference is, hey, that's in marriage. You know, but even, you know, before, if they're betrothed, they get, there's fornication that goes on. Why is then, you know, there's the bill of divorcement and things like that. So what's the difference here in Deuteronomy 22? What's the situation here? Because these are totally different situations that are going on. Exodus 22, two unmarried people have sex, they're forced to get married. Deuteronomy 24 is a married couple, somebody commits adultery, there's some uncleanness there going on. But what's happening here in Deuteronomy 22, which is more serious, is that somebody is getting married but they're faking their virginity, right? They're, part, they're selling themselves as a virgin when they're not. And this is one thing that's very serious. And we can speculate on what all the reasons could be, you know, is it because it's very important that that marriage gets off on the right foot and there's all these sorts of things. I mean, you know, we can, we can speculate on what the issue is, but we can see the seriousness of somebody being a whore, like the Bible says, in their father's house. And this is what we have nowadays. Nowadays we have girls sneaking out. You know, I don't know if you ever saw that video on Facebook or YouTube where you know, um, I think it was this prankster guy and he was just you know, made a Tinder account, just hooking up with like 13, 14, 15 year old girls and just saying like, hey, I'm gonna meet you here at the park, meet you here in the car, just going and pick, and they would just go. You know, just because he put up some supermodel picture of his, on Tinder and then he just meets them. And then what happened, I don't know if you saw the video, <laughs> But then he meets them and then the, the parents are waiting in the car and then they're like, what are you doing? So, what, what, but what I find crazy about the video is, is not only that these girls are going out and doing this, but what, made, what, made, what, what I thought about when I watched those videos is what, why are the parents so upset at the kid? The, the 13, 14 year old girl for doing that when it was their responsibility to teach them not to do this. Do you know what I mean? Like they say like, oh, what are you doing? Why are you going? Well, you're the one that gives them unsupervised access to Tinder from like 10, 11, 12 years old. You're the one that lets them dress the way they do. You're the one that lets them go to these parties, watch all these movies about fornicate. And then you get upset at them when they go out and meet some stranger, want to hook up with some weirdo that they don't even know. But no, the video, because that's, that's, that's insensitive these days to say that, to say that it's the parents' fault. You know, it's never the parents' fault. It's the kids' fault, isn't it? But no, it, it's, it's up to us to make sure that children understand this. You know, this is, what, this is what is driving this sermon, right? What's driving this sermon is I think about people's lives that have been ruined by fornication or people that have grown up in less than ideal situations or people that wish they had not done it. And I sort of think, hey, we've got to stop this. It starts with us. We have to change the culture. We have to change our mentality and stop it at us. If we don't stop it, then it's just going to keep going, right? Especially if we, God forbid, participate in this sort of sin and not stop it with us. So what's the difference here? I kind of got off on a tangent there. It's she's she's, she's uh, pretending to be a virgin and she's not. And that's the seriousness here. She's pretending to be a virgin and that's why they have to prove her virginity. So there's a few thoughts here. What's this spreading of the cloth? So a lot of people believe that this spreading of the cloth is the marriage bed sheets because when a woman obviously loses her virginity, sometimes there is bleeding. Now, when we think of this situation in today's day and age, we can think, well, you know, a lot of women can you know, break the hymen that's inside them a multiple of different ways and things like that. So maybe, you know, she may not bleed on her, on her wedding night. I think as well, we, we, we often think of this situation in today's day and age where women are doing these sorts of things. I would say like in this day and age, probably women are more homebound. They're doing work that, you know, isn't, you know, they're not, they're not going to war, riding on horseback and things like that. So chances are that their, their virginity or the, the token of their virginity in their body is kept intact a lot easier. But even so, not every woman does bleed. But this is why I think you don't want to think in this situation that it's just, man, if these parents do not have this bloodied cloth, it's like this girl, she's got nothing to, to defend her, right? Because I mean, 
you think as well, this bloody cloth, I mean, they could fake it, right? And you could just put some blood on the cloth and it could be fake. So I think there is more to this than we just read it and just think, oh man, this woman's life is dependent on whether this cloth exists or not. But that's why I think here it says, if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found. So I don't think it just depends solely on this cloth. Because like, like I said, not every woman bleeds. And remember, when people are put to death for a crime in the Bible, it's at the mouth of two or three witnesses, there's diligent inquisition. So it's not just, you, don't, you read through these passages and you just think like, man, this, this girl, like somebody just accused her of no cloth and then she's just stoned. It's, it's not just so lackadaisical like that. There is obviously a court proceeding and, you know, witnesses, you know, I think, you know, the judges could decide, hey, this is not clear cut enough. And she may get off even if she is guilty. You know, even if she knows that she's guilty, but there wasn't enough proof or evidence or witnesses in order to convict her. But if she is convicted, the punishment is very serious. All right, let's go on. So that's the tokens of virginity. You can see some of these laws that, you know, if, if these sort of laws were in place, would definitely put a stop to fornication, uh, or at least hinder it a lot, definitely deter it. If a man be found lying, <coughs> this is, uh, we continue on in Deuteronomy 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. So again, remember, these laws are in place, it's saying this is the punishment for adultery but it doesn't mean just anyone can accuse anyone like the world we live in today where you know you can just you know a man a woman can just say oh this man raped me and then he's just guilty and his proof is innocent this is this is the punishment but they're innocent until proven guilty there has to be a court proceeding that goes on but this is the punishment that god has for adultery if a damsel that is a virgin so verse 22 is a married woman so that's your classic case of adultery if a damsel that is a virgin, look at this, be betrothed unto her husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city. So why to the gate of the city? Because that's where the elders normally would sit. That's where the judges probably would be. And ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not. So what is that saying? The fact that she didn't cry and say, help me, I'm being raped. That means she's complicit in the act being in the city, and the man, because he has humbled his neighbor's wife. Do you see that? So you see how when a virgin is betrothed unto an husband, right? So they're not married yet. They haven't consummated the marriage, but he's humbled his neighbor's wife. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her, so here's the scenario that's given to encompass the scenario of rape. And even though it's a betrothed damsel, it's not that oh, only if you're a betrothed damsel in the field and you get raped, then therefore, you know, you, there's a punishment. No, no, it's, it's just the scenario that's given, but we're given the principle here that if a man rapes another woman, the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man riseth against his neighbour and slayeth him, even so is this matter. So what is the Bible saying here? It's just like when you get murdered, you didn't do anything wrong. Somebody murdered you. You know, you don't want to be murdered. So it's the same with the, with the rape. It's saying the, she gets raped and now she's no longer a virgin. You know, obviously she's participated in this fornication unwillingly, but because she cried, it's, it's, it's sin has been committed against her. She hasn't done anything wrong. That's all it's saying. For he found her in the field and the betrothed damsel cried and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed and lay hold on her and lie with her and they, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. Now a lot of Bible versions mistranslate this and they put the... Um, where am I? If a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed and they turn this into and rape her rather than and lay hold on her. Now, obviously, the Bible uses the term lay hold on her because when you lay hold on somebody, you obviously you have to lay hold on them to, to sleep with them, right? So it's, it's, if you can imagine lay hold on her, like you're being embraced or, you know, they're going off together. But if, if a Bible translates this as, and rape her and force her, that's where people, you know, have you ever heard people come up with the objection that the Bible commands you to marry your rapist? 
well, they're getting that from non-KJV Bibles, right? They're getting that from other Bibles that have translated this wrong, whereas the King James Bible doesn't use those terms because obviously it's differentiated up further where it says here that she is forced, there she's, she's innocent, and then the rapist is put to death. Whereas here, she's not forced, right? The man's just laid hold on her, they've gone off together, and that's why it's a virgin that is not betrothed. But look at this, and they be found. That's why the Bible says they are found because they are doing this together, right? So they are both found out. The virgin who's not betrothed, so you remember she's betrothed, that's adultery. If she's not betrothed, now this is fornication, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver. So what is this similar to? Exodus 22, right? Exodus 22, when a man entice a maid, they lie together and he has to... Um, it has, surely has to endow her to be his wife. That's the giving of the uh, 50 shekels of silver, paying the dowry. All right, let's continue on. So we want to see some other criminal punishments to fornication, and we'll cover bestiality, homosexuality, and even look at incest in here in Leviticus 20. In Leviticus 20, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So we saw that in Deuteronomy 22, right? Where it talks about you humbling your neighbor's wife and whatnot. So again, the death penalty for adultery. And the man that lieth with his father's wife, having covered his father's nakedness, both of them shall, be, shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So you sleep with your father's wife. And it's interesting here that the punishment, and we'll look at this in a moment, that... I believe the reason why it's, it's, it's very uh, bad to sleep with, you know, your, obviously your mother, your father, or your, mother's, your husband, your father's wife, um, because God, I think, actually, sort of, I don't know what the word would be, but, you know, that, that relationship between parent and child is, is very important as well. And I think when the lines blur between parent and child and lover, you know, parent and child takes precedence. And this is why it's very serious to break that parent-child bond rather than, uh, you know, and th than being lovers. You know, this is very serious. And, and we even see that in Genesis 2.24 where it says a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife. So we can see in that law, it's intrinsic that you don't marry your father and mother, obviously, because you have to leave father and mother to get married. So we see here... That, they're, they're, that the relationship, obviously, between a parent and a child um, is very holy as well and shouldn't be confused with the, the relationship between two lovers. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. So not only is it, does that parent-child relationship extend to upwards, but also downwards, where a father should not take his son's uh, do, uh, wife. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They, sh they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So this is where homosexuality is mentioned and obviously homosexual homosexuality has the death penalty as well. I think it's interesting that the Bible uses the phrase here, if a man also lie with mankind, as opposed to if a man lie with mankind. Why? Because Generally, when you look at homosexu homosexuals these days, they swing both ways. I just think it's like this myth, you know, that they're only go going towards one or the other because most homosexuals, like, will just start off as having sex with the, same, the, the opposite gender and then they go to the same gender. And a lot of them, you know, they're doing all sorts of things where they're, you know, s sleeping with both genders. So this is why it's interesting that the Bible uses this phrase, if a man also lie with mankind, because what, what are they also doing? Well, they're also lying with womankind. As he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and he shall slay the beast. So you see here that there are these different categories of fornication that are being mentioned here. And all of them are these laws that relate to fornication in a society. And, it, and if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down thereto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. 
they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. So not only is the person that lies with the beast put to death, but also the, the animal they don't want in society either. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness, he, he shall bear his iniquity. Now here's where it gets a little bit interesting, because this now, when it talks about a brother marrying a sister, obviously we know this situation exists in the Bible. Why? Because Abel and Cain would have had to marry sisters. And, and we see later on, uh, we'll read here in verse 19, uh, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor thy father's sister. So this is talking about your uncle and your auntie now. For he uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear their iniquity. So what is interesting here is why when we read through this, it is you do this, it's death. You sleep with your father's wife, it's death. You sleep with another person's wife, it's death. You know, there's one here where we read, um, uh, I think, oh, where did we see it before? Where there's one, I don't know where I missed it, but there's, there's one where you're burnt with fire. Here we go. Right here, if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire. So it's almost like that one, there's a specific punishment outline for somebody who would dare marry both the daughter and the mother, right? Um, but when we get to if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, what's interesting about that one is because we know this situation exists in Genesis. Where if you think about if... Uh, Adam and Eve were the first human beings. Obviously, that first generation would have had to marry a brother or a sister, right? So Adam and Eve had many brothers, uh, many um, children. So brothers and sisters in that first generation would have had to marry. Now, if they didn't marry their brother and their sister, the next generation, it would have been aunties and uncles marrying, right? So it's not until you, you're, you're past the first generation of people getting married, now you can start marrying cousins and whatnot, and therefore you no longer have to commit this brother and sister relationship that is in Leviticus 20. So this is why I think it's important, and I know my position on this is not that popular, but this is why I think it's important that we differentiate between what is a moral sin, which is it's sinful for everyone, because if it's a moral sin, therefore, God would have put Abel and Cain in a situation where they had to sin. That for all of uh, Adam and Eve's children would have had to sin, right? Because they would have either had to marry a brother or sister, or they would have had to marry an uncle or an auntie. But this is why I think it's interesting in Leviticus 20 that the punishment is different. Why does it say here, if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing. They shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He that covered his sister's nakedness, he shall bear his iniquity. So what I think we have to differentiate between here is things that are inherently morally sinful, like adultery, and things that are outlawed in the days of Israel. And what we can learn from this is that it is unwise to do today. Why is it unwise to do today? Because of the genetic issue. Right? We know that when near of kin marry and they have children, there's genetic defects that come in and problems that are associated with. And this is why God is outlawing it in the nation of Israel. But why is it allowed in Genesis and even Abraham? Abraham married his sister as well. Well, I believe it's one of these things that, like I said, is imposed on the nation of Israel, but it is not inherently sinful in and of itself, but it is something that we can learn from and know, hey, this is not wise to do. That's why this should not be encouraged in the New Testament because there is a lot of problems that stem from brother and sister uh, marrying one another. But I think it's important that we understand this because one of the biggest uh, criticisms of the Bible is, well, if in, isn't this a contradiction? If the Bible outlaws brother and sister getting married, did, who, who was Abel's wife? Who was Cain's wife? So if we understand the difference here, then we have an answer for why that is the case, rather than just basing our morality on genetic decline, which I think is a, is a problematic and unsound position. All right, let's continue. I just wanted to touch on that because we got here. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister and thy father's sister, for he uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear their iniquity. If a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, 
he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness, they shall bear their sin, they shall die childless. So isn't that interesting here that remember when you, if you married your father's wife, it is, it is death. But your uncle's wife, it's just you bear their sin, they shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall die, they shall be childless. So again, the law is a little bit different here. Why? Because there are actually laws in the Bible. I don't know if you noticed this, where if your brother dies, right, and then he doesn't raise up any seed, you actually have an obligation to raise up seed in his family if you're not married yourself. So that's an interesting law here. So obviously this law is here not saying you can never take your brother's wife because it would contradict that law but what it's saying here is when you you know obviously when your brother's still alive you can't take your brother's wife so i think there's some things here that have to be realized about and compare all scripture with scripture and this is this passage in genesis 2 24 therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh so i wanted to just go through those passages because i wanted to give you an idea of the laws that exist in the bible and why there needs to be laws in the Bible governing fornication. Now, one charge people always bring against God's word is why is God so harsh on fornication? Why is he so harsh on adultery? You know, people say, like, oh, you know, you believe the Bible. Do you believe adulterers should be stoned? Do you believe adulterers should be put to death? Well, where, yes, I do. You know, I think, I think they should be put to death. You know, after a trial and they're found guilty, this should be a law that should be in place to deter fornication, to deter adultery. Now, why is that? The last thing I want to talk about is fornication problems. Why is, so, why is God so harsh on the sin of fornication? Now, we think these laws are harsh because, like I said in the beginning of this sermon, Fornication is so commonplace. Everyone's committing fornication. Everyone's committing, you know, there's all these people committing homosexuality that we're, spent, we're not only meant to accept these days, we have to celebrate. You know, we have to promote and we have to like, you know, all, our, all the businesses have to make it a point that, hey, we are, you know, we're for you guys. And if they don't, then they cause up, you know, all the SJWs these days. So not only do we have to celebrate diversity, <laughs> right everyone's committing adultery you know because of adultery people are getting divorced and family breakup and all this stuff it's so commonplace this day these days that if we think if we were to have a law that would put adulterers to death there may be nobody left alive well obviously if you were to implement a law it's not retro retroactive right so it's not not that you implement a law into place and then everyone who's done it in the past is now called to to call to to court for their crimes you know when a law is put in place it's from then onwards but you know should should that be the case yeah because it would be great to have a society that uh, like i said discourages fornication so if we had god's laws in place we wouldn't have the problems with fornication like we have today now first of all we talked about genetic defects right so that's the problem with you know father and, and daughter and mother and son and things like that there's genetic defects that come into place but what's another problem with rampant fornication in a society it's the disease that goes in a society so we know that when fornication happens homosexuality happens they're spreading disease you know the risks of homosexual sex but you also have you know fornication spreading disease throughout a society now one thing i don't know if this is true but one thing i heard about aids is that it actually comes from the animal kingdom i don't know if you guys have heard of that where people say that aids was actually like it's like a common um, illness to like a, a monkey or something but obviously if that's the case that means somebody committed fornication and, and that's why bestiality is outlawed, because there are, are likely diseases and things that exist in the animal kingdom that if fornication takes place, then spreads into the human population. So that is one of the obvious problems with fornication, is you have the sexually transmitted diseases, the diseases from people sleeping with animals, the diseases with people having unprotected sex with all sorts of people, and then it's just spreading in a society, right? where even now, when people now, <clears throat> they, they, get, they decide now to get married, 
they decide to settle down, but now they're still worried, worried they're going to pass something on to their husband. Why? Because they've lived a fornicating lifestyle prior to getting married, prior to settling down. And your marriage now can have these problems because you got it from a previous sin that you've been doing. Not only that, not only uh, do we have disease and genetic defects, <clears throat> but we have the problem of abortion. Now, why, why is abortion such a big problem? Why is it so hard to fight against the tide of abortion? Because so many men and women are committing fornication and getting pregnant and not wanting the children. That's why it's happening. And you know, it's not popular these days, even today, you know, when they talk about abortion and they say like, well, adoption is the answer. Well, adoption is just an alternative to abortion, but it's not the solution. The solution is for people to not sleep together to begin with. But it's a sign of the time that we live in today that to say something like that is not politically correct. You know, whenever you hear the discussions about abortion in the news and the discussion about abortion solutions, when does everyone, anyone ever talk about stopping teenagers from having sex to begin with? Because at the same time, they're handing out pills, handing out condoms, teaching them how to have sex in schools, and then they're like, oh, now we have to have a solution to, to abortion. No, now we have to try and fight for adoption. No, the problem is even deeper than that. The problem is with fornication to begin with. And it, like I said, it's a sign of the times we live in when it's not popular to say that. You know, and of course we have to speak the truth with love. But we have to speak the truth with love. We don't just love without speaking the truth. And that's what people think love is these days. You love and you don't speak the truth. But you have to speak the truth with love. And I'm not angry at people that have made mistakes in the past. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying if you've made mistakes in the past that, you know, you should hang on to that guilt you know you confess that sin you move on what i am most concerned about is how we raise the next generation how we think about fornication we need to make sure that we educate our children that we have these conversations with them that we talk to them about the topic of sex you know don't think it's so don't be raised like with a catholic mentality where it's just like sex is taboo and it's just something we have to do because we procreate. You know, it's just you'll, you'll get it eventually. You need, to, you need to teach your children about these things. And so many women, so many men, I, I think it's more so women, right? Because men, I, I think men, men are a bit more clued on that they're taking advantage of women. I think some women do that as well. But, you know, sometimes I hear about stories of women. They grow up, they have no guidance. They haven't grown up in a strong family. And, you know, they're seeking, uh, you know, a relationship. You know, that fatherly relationship they didn't have. And then they go and get a boyfriend. And now the boyfriend replaces that relationship that they ought to have in the family. And they're dependent emotionally on them. And then they feel they need to give up their virginity in order to keep that relationship going. And I just feel like it's such a shame because we as parents need to make sure our daughters grow up valuing their virginity, knowing that they don't have to give their body to another guy to feel loved, you know, to, to feel important in that relationship. You know, have, have, some, have some shame about it, have some dignity to keep yourself pure. So like I said, with abortions, that is the root of the pro problem. And, you know, we, we need to understand that that comes first you know before we think about how are we going to solve all these unwanted children well one thing we can do is we can stop them from being created even to begin with right rather than killing them let's just not conceive them let's teach people to live godly and pure lives so that's the problems with just fornication in general the disease genetic problems the ramp the rampant abortion but one reason why God hates fornication so much is because when you read in Malachi 2, the reason why he created the family, the family is there to create a godly environment, to raise godly children. And if you think about how much God loves the fatherless, he loves the widow, because you think about it, like a widow is like somebody that's lost their husband, and you can lose your husband to adultery. So he hates that as he hates people left in that situation where a, where a woman is like a widow 
or children are not raised in the family environment that they, sh they have a right to be raised in. Right? Like children don't control that. It's up to us to control that as parents. So Malachi 2, look at what we read. Yet you say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and, thy, and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? So what he's talking about, the one flesh. Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. So what is he saying? He hates marriages breaking up. Marriage is falling apart because he wants, he wants families to be there to raise a godly seed. And this is something that every study shows. You know, like even when they talk about same-sex parenting and whatnot, all the studies show that the, the, the best situation for a child is to be raised by a mother and father that love each other. And this is, the, this is why fornic like sex creates such a strong bond because what it's, what it's ideally made for is to create this strong bond between husband and wife. So what are some of the problems? Why does God hate fornication so much? He hates adultery so much? Because obviously sex leads to children being created. And not only is there the bloodshed of abortion, but now you have the rise of fatherless children, single parent homes, when you have adultery and pornography and fornication just rampant, you have men committing adultery and running off with other women, and now you have children being raised in families that are not ideal, that don't have that stable spiritual leadership and that loving environment. Nothing can compare to a family. Amen. You know, you can't replace a family with the church. You can't replace the family situation with like a school. You can't like just, you know, you can't just send your kid to daycare and think it's doing the same thing as a mother loving and raising the child. Do you know what I mean? So nothing can replace, that's why it's so important that that family is strong, that, re that relationship is strong because it has real societal effects. So, we see this in Exodus 34. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And look at this, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So this is not talking about your sin sending you to hell. This is a talking about the consequences of sin in a society. And I think of this verse when I think of fornication because if we don't break that cycle of fornication, this is what you see in like black America where it's so matriarchal because they keep fornicating and then women have to raise their children as a single mother and then because the single mother struggles to raise their children right, then they go on and fornicate and then the cycle just continues. This is what I believe Exodus 34 is alluding to, where the sins of the previous generations can affect the next generations unless we do something about it. And that's why you can see when fornication just is rampant in society, you see the rise of orphans, you see the rise of adoptions, which is not ideal. You see the rise of same-sex parenting. You know, this is why same-sex parenting is now being pushed because fornication is rampant in a society. The, the homosexuality is accepted. Now they want to have children. They can't have children, so they have to have somebody else's children. Single-parent homes, like I said, and putting away divorce. And like I said, I said this before, I just want to touch on this again. Sex is such an intimate and emotional experience that the reason why it's like that is it's meant to bind a husband and wife together. But you know, see what fornication does is it, it is now binding two people together that, that, that might, it, they, they shouldn't, they may not, it may not be best for them to be together. See, this is why when I talk to couples about how they should go about dating and things, you need to move the relationship philosophically forward. 
right? Because you need to make sure that you are on the same page philosophically rather than intimately or emotionally. And if people are fornicating, what happens is it pushes that relationship emotionally and intimately further down and it's hard to pull out of that. So when you realize, hey, I shouldn't get married to this person, it's too late. You know, it's hard for you to pull out of that emotional and intimate bond. So this is why it's so important that fornication doesn't occur. It needs to be in the right place because because it creates such an emotional and intense bond between two people, this is why it's, it's made for marriage. It's made to bind married people together. But when it's done outside of marriage, then it's building, it's strengthening relationships that shouldn't always come to be. And then again, this is the negative effect on society where two people are now together raising children, not having the right philosophy and not creating that environment that children need to live up and have and be a God, godly seed. What's another danger of having sex outside of marriage is that sex is like a drug. You know, that feeling that sex creates is, is, can be addictive. You know, this is why people get addicted to pornography. This is why people get addicted to going out with prostitutes. This is why people get addicted to fornicating or they get addicted to keep sleeping with the same person. It's addicting. And that's why it's better, just like with drugs, it's better just not do it to begin with than to start and now it's hard to stop. So just a, just a few closing thoughts. So like I said, and I think you get the point out, for fornication has real and dangerous societal effects. Look at this verse in Leviticus 19. This is the last verse I want to share with you. It says, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. Amen. Isn't that an interesting passage here? That it says, so it says, do, where, who is the commandment to? It's to the parents. It's saying, don't let your daughter be a prostitute. What does that mean? Don't let her go and sleep around. You know, don't let her act like a prostitute. And, you know, because we, we are supporting this culture. See, this culture has to change with us. And it's not just the sex. It's the culture of, you know, promoting the movies that promote fornication. Dress, the way you dress. This is why I keep emphasizing, ladies, how we dress matters. Because that as well is supporting this culture of fornication. When you're dressing in the mini skirts, when you're dressing in the tight clothing, you're, you're supporting this idea that women go out and they're seen, right? And they're, and they're attracting the guys. This is, this is part of promoting this culture of fornication that needs to stop. Because why? Because it has, like I said, has real societal dangerous effects and, pe and, we, and, we, and we don't want to be complicit and have it keep going. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whore. Look at this, and the land become full of wickedness. So isn't it interesting here that it starts with fornication, right? But because of fornication, the land now is just full of wickedness. That's what we see today. That's what we see in Australia. Why do we see Australia the way it is? Because of fornication, the family breakdown, and we're not raising a godly generation to put a stop to this. So it's got to start here. It's got to start in the house of God. It's got to start right here with us. We have to say to us, so we've got a purpose in our heart. You know what? The generations before us might have messed up, but that's not going to happen in my family. In my family, my children are going to understand what is pure, the dangers of fornication, and I want to make sure they don't make the same mistakes that maybe I've made. All right? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, I, you know, I just pray that um, people take this sermon um, with the right heart. Uh, Lord, I'm not upset at anyone. I've made mistakes in my past as well. I'm, I'm, I'm just angry at, you know, that these warnings were not given to me. That the, uh, the effects of fornication were not warned to me from a young age. And uh, Lord, I just pray that it can start with us here. That we can stop this cycle. And Lord, maybe the world can go down the tube. But I pray, Lord, that you'll give the wisdom to the parents here so that we don't let the next generation make the same mistakes that we've seen previous generations make. 
So Lord, help us. Lord, we're not perfect. We don't always do what we should. But Lord, I pray that this sermon uh, will speak to the hearts of the people here and really convict them, Lord, to make a difference um, with what they can with where they are now. So we thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.